Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David Ross, and this is the um, the fifteenth in our uh, fall series of of uh, conversations with artists from different parts of of the world. And um, uh, we're glad that you could join us today. Uh, I doing this program as part of the School of Visual Arts Curatorial Practice Graduate Program, and this is the first year we've ever done. Uh, combined webinar and then a private Zoom uh, following that. And it's been quite successful. I, I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I think, and I hope you have as well. I see not a lot of you are here already, so that's a good sign. Uh, today, uh, we have the great pleasure of of uh, welcoming uh, an artist who's a, an old friend, um, Ragnar Kajartensen. I think when we fi first met Ragnar in um, in New York, in like 2011, when you won the Malcolm uh, uh, the Malcolm McLaren Award for, in, at Performa, and, and yeah. then I uh, started seeing a lot of your work, and then uh, of course we had that extraordinary, for me, very memorable, for you probably very common experience of uh, uh, that I had of singing with you in front of the Parliament uh, when you were protesting the uh, the um, the inevitable election of a right wing majority to uh, to the Icelandic government. And that was one of the coldest and most memorable moments in my <laughs> life. It was April and uh, we sat at, st stood out there and I sang the English version and you sang the Icelandic version of uh, a very short and powerful song, which obviously did a lot to change history, right? I mean, it's obvious. Yeah, it just did, did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's always good when you realize that a work of art can actually have no consequences. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, Ragnar uh, has produced an extraordinary body of work uh, in performance and in, in video installations uh, and also in kind of some kind of curatorial projects uh, as well. Uh, and we'll see a little of that today uh, as he uh, was really one of the first people to help bring uh, uh, Pussy Riot uh, work, uh, actual work to uh, to a, a, a worldwide audience, which is extraordinarily important in these dark times. Uh, I I should mention uh, that as um, as part of what Ragnar has asked the, the graduate students in this program to do uh, for for today's conversation was to listen to. A, a George Michael Wham song <clears throat> from a long time ago called a Praying for Time. Uh, and if, a, a, I don't know if you're going to refer to it at all in your conversation, in your webinar today, but for those of you who have never heard it or haven't heard it in a long time, listen to it again. It's a very dark song and a, and a very dark song from George Michael is, is a, a thing to behold. Yeah, I, I'm just, it's like, I, you know, I it was just because you had this idea if I should... Uh... If there was anything I thought the students should, you know, check out that I've been much <laughs> into, and kind of like this, like in in these kind of this brutal fall and into winter, I've just been listening to this song a lot, and uh -huh. uh, and uh, and I just always love the composition when it's like mega pop, but like really profound. There's yeah. something. Uh, and, 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 but and what I don't remember what year it was uh, was from. Was it from nineteen? It's from nineteen ninety. Yeah. 1990. So, yeah. uh, in the context for that song, I mean, in his life, it must have been something heavy. I think going it was on. kind of mainly, I think when the song came out, it was basically kind of just, you know, seeing kind of the rising inequalities, you know, especially like in his home country in England and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just, you know, kind of the, the whole, uh, the whole idea of, uh, what's the word again? Um, uh, forgot the word. It's a very important word. My English is sometimes a bit. <laughs> it's all right. You know, it, it, it's well better than my Icelandic, which <laughs> it was know, kind of it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really like a song on the human condition and and uh, kind of dealing with it in a very loving kind of non judgmental way, which no, I really. I, like. I think that's true, and it's actually a beautiful song, uh, and it's kind of uh, you could it it plays into your kind of epic sensibility you can see how that song could just be repeated over and over and over again and become like a uh, an environment uh, 
Uh, yeah, and it's kind of like in my studio, repeat it over and over again. I'm just like, <laughs> <into> this <moment. laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Just like the rich, I, I, I would imagine poor, life in your so. studio must be like that. I recall first going into Vito Akanchi studio and he had Japanese noise music playing over and over again in the wow. background. All these architects, they were all just working, listening to Japanese noise music. I thought like, this, and they were all smoking. I was thinking like, well, this is this is a very specific environment, you know. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I, I take it <laughs> take it away, Ragnar, and I'll be in the background and I'll keep my audio on, but I'll I'll turn my camera off to give us a little bit more bandwidth. So, okay. Ragnar. Great. Uh, thank you, and thank you everyone for uh, for joining in this l talk. I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, about my work, and I'm kind of gonna use like just a walk through through my most recent exhibition at the Louisiana Museum in uh, in Denmark in Humlebeck close to Copenhagen and uh it was a very very joyous uh, uh and they and what's it called endeavor that I did with the uh, uh with the curator uh, Tina Kolstrup from the Louisiana and also my partner and very frequent collaborator Ingeborg Sjöjansdóttir of like of uh, gathering older works and uh, and also you know creating some new works for the for the space and for the context of Louisiana and uh, and it was sort of interesting that uh, Tina Kolstrup was very interested in this. Uh, Kind of thread through my work, which has kind of been from the beginning, just since I was in art school, and uh, uh, I was lucky enough that there was a, uh, there was a there was a course on feminist art, which just kind of like blew my mind, and uh, and 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 since then I became you know I kind of found uh, yeah I just you know. Just found it extremely exciting and uh, exciting this idea of identity in art, which very much comes from from the from the feminist artists in my in my art historical understanding, and uh, and uh, so so kind of from 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 just early on from an art school, I started playing with the with my identity, just like you know, ask the problem, and I just find that interesting. And uh, and uh, here, like, so the show starts with this big, big uh, plinth or kind of a marble monument just outside the Louisiana. And I I love kind of these these uh, I love this I love neoclassical monuments, especially kind of World War One monuments with that aesthetic. And uh, and so. This one is, um, if you look at it closer, it's it's totally uh, a faux marble, and uh, it's just like it's just plywood painted and pretending to be marble, and and plywood painted as fire on the top, and it has this uh, sentence, uh, "epic waste of love and understanding," which is, uh, which actually uh, came from. Uh, from an argument I was having with my partner Ingeborg Sjöjansdóttir, uh, where we it was you know one of those kind of quiet arguments, and then Ingeborg just said this beautiful sentence: "I hope this is not an epic waste of love and understanding." And then that kind of <clears throat> became that piece, and became the title of the show in uh, Louisiana. And uh, then after you see this work, the the the, the next one is a, a pretty. As you enter the uh, the rooms where the exhibition was, there is this. It's a pretty recent piece called "Guilt and Fear," and it's just about. It's a, you know I think it's like seven hundred and fifty salt and pepper shakers, in the through the whole hallway. Uh, just saying guilt and fear, 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 as you walk through them. And uh and of course salt is guilt and pepper is fear. And it's sort of 
these uh, these big emotions that big that that uh, I find very interesting, you know, kind of made for the for uh, domestic use. So so the the piece is an installation and also also uh, it's a it's an addition where people kind of can take guilt and fear and have it on their kitchen table. And then as you the next as you entered there was this piece which you see there it's uh, me with a guitar and in a white suit it's a piece from uh, 2003 called mercy and uh, i am just uh, with the guitar repeating the phrase Oh, why do I keep on hurting you? Why do I keep on hurting you? And I just find it very interesting in um, in country music and in, and in pop music in general, this, uh, this sort of kind of male view of, uh, of kind of being victimized as feeling like a victim as you are betraying someone. And it's very, that's kind of very, that's very often through 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 country and blues, etc. So um, this this little song loop was kind of a start of uh, of, uh, of of a thing I I continue to work with a lot in my work, and in the space there are uh, one hundred forty nine paintings of my friend Patla Gubirson, a performance artist in a speedo. These paintings were done uh, when I did the Icelandic Pavilion in Venice in 2009. And uh, you see, they kind of just like uh, very, they they are just from from ceiling to to floor. And uh, it's a chronicle of this performance that we did in the in the Icelandic Pavilion in Venice in 2009, where we just drank a beer, smoked cigarettes. And I did one portrait of him every day in a, where he's in a speedo smoking and drinking. And uh, it was sort of a, it was an, uh, it was sort of a experiment, a, a human experiment we did with the kind of, of course, like a nod to endurance performance art and, uh, and kind of uh, the idea of manhood and, and, you know, and, um, Objectification, etc., and uh, and the uh, the paintings just piled up, and the beers piled up, and the cigarettes, and it just became our little hell in Venice. Here's a, a piece which was also there called Guilt Trip which is with Iceland's kind of most popular comedian, just walking in a winter landscape, uh, shooting shotgun shells into nothingness. It's a piece from 2006. And here you see a painting uh, and uh, kind of, and here are some pieces uh, done in the kind of, with with we with the play of like Icelandic Danish history because the the show is in uh, Louisiana which is of course in Denmark and Iceland used to be a colony of Denmark until 1944 and uh, and there's just this interesting history that we share which is very unknown in Denmark but very known here like we kind of we we Icelanders kind of built our national identity from being kind of victims of Danish colonization. And, and sometimes it's it's kind of hilariously uh, exaggerated to, like Icelandic nationalism is so built on it that it becomes often exaggerated. And, uh, and uh, I just find it interesting, this uh, kind of idea of victimhood and uh, in, our, in our kind of national psyche. And this is a piece from 2003 called colonization where i with an icelandic comedian we're just in this kind of very kind of a crappy set it looks like you know kind of a, like a a comedy show set which is supposed to be a, like an 18th century uh, loft of a, of a danish merchant and he is just beating up 
uh, an Icelandic peasant, which is played by myself. There you see me kind of being drummed in a barrel. And it's just like kind of violence, 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 the Dane beating of the Icelander. And uh, and it plays on this on this idea of colonization, how how uh, we perceive it here, and also like how yeah how exaggerated it is, and also I just find it super interesting because like maybe like historically Danes were very often trying to uh, make Icelanders uh, kind of more merciful to each other, etc. But like, uh, so uh, Icelandic history is very brutal until pretty recently when it became really nice. And uh, and this is a play on our shared history. And uh, and this space kind of has has more um, has more um, experiments with history. Here is a it's a it's a pile of um, wood pile of wooden rubbish from it's a piece from 2007 and it's uh, and it's the wooden rubbish from uh, from a theater uh, box a theater box in a in a theater in berlin called the admiral's palast and this used to be adolf's hit adolf hitler's theater box and uh, and there's a pl plank over it which says uh, i called helgi Björs and he uh, arranged Adolf Hitler's theater box for me. And uh, it's kind of on the absurdity of history. It's like that this guy, Helgi Björs, was an Icelandic singer who owned a theater in Berlin. And I met him like in a bar in Berlin. He was just saying that he had this theater box in his theater that he had to get rid of. And that ended up becoming this piece and, uh, and kind of, you know, it's like it's it's a um, it's a thought piece on the banality of evil, etc. And uh, beside it, here is a video piece, a uh, pretty recent one, which was uh, premiered in Moscow in two thousand twenty-one, one before the war before the invasion, the Russian invasion into Ukraine. And it's a re, restaging of uh, two attacks on uh, kind of one of the greatest paintings in, uh, in, um, in kind of, in, in Russian art history, but it's, it's made by uh, a Ukrainian painter called Ilya Repin and uh, I think I became an artist because my parents went to Moscow in the early 80s and they saw this painting and my mother came and told me that there was such a powerful painting in Moscow that somebody tried to kill it with a knife. And uh, and it's show it's a painting you it's hard to see it here but it's a painting from 1883 by Ilya Repin uh called Ivan Ivan the Terrible and his son. And Ivan the Terrible is sort of the the founding father of Russia, and this uh, and yeah, it kind of says a lot that he's the founding father of Russia. Is called Ivan the Terrible because his um, his idea of governing was just through terror and uh, and constant horror, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he even killed his son in a in a in a spot. And that became this painting. But interestingly enough, it's like the kind of the masterpiece of uh, 19th century art from the Russian Empire. And uh, but interestingly enough, it has been twice attacked in 1913 and also in 2018 by Russian religious nationalists, because it tells of a troubling story of like how power kills the future, how kind of how um yeah how the uh, how the future is just just uh, slain because of whims of the elder and uh, and kind of tells a story of um, 
yeah, of, of totality, this painting. And and I just found it interesting that it was twice vandalized in a very, very uh, symmetrical manner. So it has this kind of a Rony Horn um, feeling of symmetry through history. And uh, so I restaged the the um, the attacks in my studio in Reykjavik, and uh, on the on the left you see uh, 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 the attacker in 1913, and on the right you see the attacker in 2018 who who broke a protective glass with a museum I don't museum pole. And it's just like a lot of noise, and you know, in 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 a way, kind of, uh, is uh, has a resemblance to colonization in this like it's a problematic history, almost yeah, becoming becoming comical. It's kind of like the Keystone Cops or something when they're smashing the paintings and being beaten up by security guards, etc. And here's a piece called uh, "A Lot of Sorrow." Which is um, which is a uh, documentation of a performance or a, or yeah a video just a video piece where uh, I kind of want to do the uh, we did the performance with the national this American band to make this video and it's um it's a six hour long video of the national playing their song sorrow and uh, it was. Uh, shot at uh, MoMA PS1 in New York and it's basically a concert where they just play this song called Sorrow over and over again and I just find it uh, interesting to use repetition as a as a as kind of a tool to sculpturalize or or turn into a painting something that is uh, something that is uh, narrative like a song or or a Kind of theatrical scene or something, and and this song becomes just like almost like white noise because it's just repeated and repeated and repeated, and and also something magical happens with the fatigue of the players and the uh, yeah and this kind of yeah it's kind of uh, this kind of shamanistic ritual of sorrow, which is this this song being repeated again and again. It's a it's a totally beautiful song. With this, this kind of hypnotic quality that they that they uh, do on constant repeat, and after that you came into a room where there's a video installation of mine called "The Visitors," which was uh, shot uh, in upstate New York in a place called Rokeby Farm, and uh, it's a. Uh, it's a crazy interesting house like on the Hudson where which was originally built by a by a guy called John Armstrong who was the uh, he was the minister of war for America in the beginning of the 19th century and he like he fought in the in the war of independence with George Washington etc and uh, but they, but he came kind of back into history this this John Armstrong guy because uh, back into uh, discussion because of uh, he was the minister of war when the White House and uh, the Capitol were uh, attacked by the British in 1812 and uh, and then but the the house was originally built by him and then like uh, kind of redone by the Astors in the 1870s and interestingly enough like it's still totally kind of intact how it was. At the turn of the 20th century, and it's now inhabited by the descendants of uh, of the yeah, of the, the the people who originally built it, and um, and it's uh, because most of the houses up there are kind of are usually uh, kind of owned by some tech billionaires or or are museums, but this one is a weird bohemian haven. It's close to Bard College and. Uh, and uh, it's full of the kind of tenants who rent little huts and houses on the on the premises, and uh, and Ricky and Anya who who own the building with their family. They they uh, they just you know try to maintain the building, and uh, and it's it's basically uh, it's quite a blissful place. And so I I uh, I got uh, a musician friends of mine from Iceland. 
to join me for a week there where we would uh, rehearse a song and uh, and uh, make a kind of opus out of it, which was like 40 minutes long. And you you experience the piece why with work walking uh, from from screen to screen, sort of. And uh, and it's kind of uh, yeah, I remember like always thinking about it as some kind of a kind of nihilist feministic gospel, this song, uh, because the song was made from uh, from uh, from sentences and videos and uh, and performances of uh, of uh, Icelandic artist Austi Sib Gunnarsdóttir who kind of in her performances drops these gorgeous sentences and uh, we were collaborating on a piece and uh, and then uh, I just started like building up in, in my head and you know made this song uh, called Once Again I Fall Into My Feminine Ways and the piece is called The Visitors and it's a nine channel video installation where you basically walk between those screens and uh, you mix the song with walking between them and um, and um, and uh, yeah exper you can like it's sort of it was very much uh, like in my art I'm often very I think uh, Stockhausen's idea of spatial music had a huge uh, effect on me um, so it's kind of like a Stockhausen spatial music piece where where music is not two dimensional, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, I think it's a piece that Stockhausen would have really hated because it's like in this kind of very uh, almost kind of a sentimental uh, country music style, one could say. And here, as you walked out of the visitors in uh, Louisiana, you came to the staircase. And on the staircase, there was a, a, a new piece called uh, Bangaman, or which would translate as Scared Man. And it's a performance piece that uh, was performed by uh, nine different performers every day for, uh, for the duration of the show. And they are just walking back and forth on this ledge you see there in a tuxedo. And just being scared, scared of heights, scared of something. And as you see, it's kind of the, it's like, it's a man in this kind of ultimate Western culture attire, which is the tuxedo, just uh, walking back and forth on this wall, scared. And, uh, and, and it's a sort of, a, it's a sort of a play with language because, because yeah, in, in Danish, bang a man, just sounds so great and uh and they were fantastic these guys who performed it and it was a total pleasure working with them and uh yeah here are some drawings close to it it's a piece called troubled by love killed by death but we'll not go into that one and then after you walk through this you came to this video installation a pretty re re recent video installation I made with uh, Margaret Bjarnadóttir and Bryce Desner. And uh, and uh, Margaret is a choreographer and an artist, and uh, Bryce is a composer and also a, a, a rock and roll musician. He's, a, he's one of the guitar players in The National. And, uh, and uh, we created a, a dance piece uh, for dancers and uh, acoustic guitars, and uh, it's as you as, and uh, it was originally done in the theater, but then we found a way to uh, kind of present it as a video work, and uh, it's just the uh, it's like it's a performance from the uh, from the Icelandic uh, dance company. And uh, they 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 also kind of like I would say like co-wrote the piece with us, and uh, we made it in um, in um, in uh, yeah in in rehearsals for for uh, four months, and 
they were it was, they were amazing to work with because uh, it, none of them knew how to play the guitar when we started and Bryce wrote this very rhythmic music for uh, for yeah one two three four five six seven eight nine uh, guitar players and uh, and uh, one could say that that uh, it's a uh, it's really music that is written for dancers it's like it's a music that's impossible for uh, musicians to play because every movement the dancers do is uh, is musical so if a if a dancer like goes turns herself in a circle it becomes like it becomes very sonic or like if they move fast through the screen it's very sonic so it's it's very much a play on uh, on on kind of yeah the explosive sonics of divinity as one could one could say and uh and uh, and the uh the idea of the piece it was you know it was sort of to we wanted to create a piece which like kind of felt like nothing in a way and you know in our very troubled crazy times to to kind of make a reference to the song and dance movies of the of the 1940s so as you can see it's like all these uh these kind of mirrored floors and curtains and it's basically a song and dance movie this this video and uh and uh and here's another play with uh with uh with another kind of costume of western culture which is the blue jeans and the t-shirt and the kind of uh yeah, playing with the playing with the kind of identity and the uh, and the uh, and kind of the the meaning of I just always love kind of the meaning of cliches. It's like my my favorite uh, kind of my mantra I work from, which is like from a piece by Icelandic artist Magnus Sigurdsson. Is like is is uh, is uh, the cliche is the ultimate expression. And uh, yeah, so here, we're, and then after that, we we went to this uh, kind of panoramic room in the Louisiana, where uh, you just see this kind of crazy, beautiful view and, you know, over to Sweden and you are just in this kind of ideal architecture in this ideal country and everything looks so ideal. And, uh, and there on the, uh, the floor there's a huge screen with a with a video that uh, I made with uh, my friend and uh, and actress uh, comedian uh, Saga Karnastotir uh, who's just kind of yeah she's like the greatest com stand up comedian in Iceland and a fantastic actress and uh, and we uh, we just play this couple and we as you can see we shot shot the video in the in the space where um, where uh, it's shown and we just play this couple who say the sentence again and again in, in Danish which is uh, which is a very much used Danish phrase when you're having a nice time which just means what have we done to deserve having it so good and I just always find this a very interesting phrase it's a Danish phrase that is also used here in Iceland, like you know, I kind of knew it from uh, from very old people around me. It's like a it's a it's a classic Danish phrase that you know when it's used in Iceland, it's always used in Danish, like "Hvad har vi dukket for har det så godt." And uh, and it's sort of you could kind of in English, it's all it's you know, I mean, in America, one says uh, you know, check your privileges, but this is sort of like check your privileges. Ding. Uh, so it's it's both um, it's both kind of uh, like kind of remember remembering how lucky we are, and there's it's also a bit smug also. I just find it I just find it a, a, a such an interesting phrase because it's both appreciation of life and also kind of kind of smug when you're like you know why do we actually have it so good? Is it because of you know of how the world is structured around the around this moment that we're actually in this gorgeous architecture having a nice time and 
and uh, and it's an so this is a an eleven hour piece where we are just uh, uh, staying in the space, just saying the sentence. What have we done, done to deserve to have it so good? And uh, and uh, yeah, kind of it's a sort of a play with the the comedy of it all and the the, the huge melancholy of it all at the same time. And of course, we we have some drinks and fruits and yeah so we just stayed in that frame for uh, for 11, 11 hours and you see the the dusk coming in etc and then the show ended with this uh, this piece called uh, bliss which is a 12 hour long video uh I uh, kind of made out of a performance I first did in 2011, and then I I uh, I shot it with the with the in collaboration with the LA Phil at the uh, Red Cat in in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, and it's just a uh, yeah it's a kind of a bad picture because you just see the couple. Uh, the uh, the count and the countess. It's the last. Uh, it's the last uh, scene of *Marriage of Figaro*, where the count asks the countess for forgiveness. And uh, and uh, it's just like this gorgeous music written by Mozart. And uh, and it's like the the whole opera. It's just such an interesting scene because the whole opera is just like this. Um, this comedy about like a very 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 dark shit where like it's a, a comedy about people trying to uh, arrange things so that the uh, the count does not use his privileges to just to rape one of his servants and then like when his wife finds out that he was trying to rape his servant then uh, he asks her forgiveness and then she says uh, i forgive you because I am kinder than, kinder than you. And then the whole cast sings, all is forgiven and we can be happy forever. And it's sort of like kind of, kind of like, a, it's a, you know, it's one could say it's like this thing called like a romantic song of the patriarchy where like, we see this as this kind of, when, when you look at it again and again, this beautiful scene, this beautiful music, it just becomes kind of nightmarish. But it's always like, Yes, forgiveness is granted and we can be forever happy. But, you know, we, and also like Mozart knew it when he was writing it, I think that there's the kind of brutal irony of the scene that like he's not really asking for forgiveness and nothing is going to change. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, and it's again like, uh, like uh, the, uh, like uh, a lot of sorrow. It's a, it's a, it's a long, long ass performance with the, uh, for the performers. And the musicians to stay stay in this situation for twelve hours. But I, I played one of the roles in it. I played Antonio the gardener, and it was actually pretty great to be soaked in Mozart for twelve hours and in this scene. And the reason why I often do these kind of um, long pieces is is because. Uh, I, f I feel like I enjoy doing them and then I started doing them with friends and family and and then realized that like other people also enjoy doing them and there's there's this weird joy to kind of go out of daily life and just be soaked in Mozart for 12 hours you know and uh and then in the in the park outside the Luciana there's this uh it's a beautiful sculpture park there and uh, like very, very nice, you know, Scandinavian restaurant there overlooking Sweden. And there we put up this piece of mine called uh, Scandinavian Pain. And, uh, and, uh, and kind of the, 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 this neon piece is a, it's a play on this uh, idea of like pain in Scandinavian literature and art as this, as this uh, very big thing, you know, from like, you know, Strindberg, Ibsen, Tove Jansson, all kinds of stuff. But, um, but, uh, but like now Scandinavia is, is of course, 
very wealthy and uh, kind of pretty happy in comparison comparison to many places on earth so so scandinavian pain is some kind of a some kind of a misery deluxe one could say and uh and there you go and so then this kind of it was like a perfect setting for this piece in this like perfect museum and this perfect restaurant it's just like scandinavian pain at sunset and then i'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the fact that uh, also during this exhibition, we uh, they uh, the, uh, the, we uh, I along with Ingeborg Segerstotter and Dorothy Kirch uh, curated a show with uh, with Pussy Riot, which was made by uh, Maria Lochina, uh, and uh, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the background of that story here because like I did a show in in Moscow before the war in 2021 where uh, where uh, there where the museum this new big museum called Gestva was turned into a live performance there was just like this nave in the building was just was a film studio where we were filming uh, soap opera called Santa Barbara which was the first the first uh, american soap to be played in the former Soviet unions after after the fall of the Soviet Union. So one week after communism uh, collapsed, this soap opera Santa Barbara was played every night at uh, eight thirty on public television. So it was kind of a part of the the crash course of capitalism in the post Soviet era. And and I kind of wanted to play with this. Uh, notion to uh, to to do this soap opera in kind of in the in kind of the brutal kind of rising totalitarian environment in in Russia, which which was there definitely before the war and uh, and uh, to kind of uh, yeah to to sort of mirror. Uh, you know, a, a, a reminder of of the this Santa Barbara period as an idea of freedom, but also uh, Santa Barbara as this kind of as this kind of very macabre, uh, kitsch version of uh, of capitalism, which then became like the oligarch capitalism in Russia. So so people could just walk into the set there, and. Uh, uh, in the museum, you could just see actors, technical crew, etc., uh, acting out scenes, acting out the scenes from the one first one hundred episodes of Santa Barbara. But uh, and like constant drama. I really like soap operas because they are almost like um, they are almost like a uh, an emotional sculpture. It's just kind of like noise of constant emotions, constant breakdowns, and. Uh, and uh, and it was it was a very interesting thing to be doing this piece, and then like kind of the war was brewing, and you know nobody nobody thought uh, Russia was going to invade Ukraine, but there was like a lot of nervousness, of course, going on, and uh, and one third of the of the cast and crew were Ukrainian, and uh, it's sort of like you know it's uh, so it was. Uh, you can imagine like the shock when the, the war broke out on February 24th, uh, 2022. And then uh, on that same day, we closed down the exhibition. So so we didn't do the the whole, the whole 100 episodes as we were going to do, but we did 83 episodes. And But on this, on the set of Santa Barbara, I met with the, uh, yeah, here you, uh, I met with the, uh, uh, Maria Lochina from uh, from Pussy Riot and uh, and uh, she came and we sort of did a state visit with her around uh, the exhibition and uh, and started kind of plotting to to do some kind of a Pussy Riot show in Iceland and at the time when I met her Masha was uh, was basically uh, under house arrest and was working with working with an uncle tag and uh but she was very interesting but she was the first uh free person i met in russia it was like the first person which was relaxing to talk to and uh wasn't kind of involved in this whole brutal codependency of 
of everyone there. And uh, so kind of one led, uh, we started plotting that, but then like she and her girlfriend, Lucy, got arrested again and again and again and again. And, uh, and it became very, very, like their situation became very brutal and like the war broke out and uh, the uh, the the uh, kind of crackdown on dissidents became much more became steadily more serious and as you know now it's like very nightmarish but uh masha got out of russia uh kind of smuggled herself out as a as a as a food delivery career out of her apartment and there's constant surveillance and uh and the uh and uh, we met here in Iceland, me and Ingeberg and Masha. And uh, and this is a picture from my studio here in Reykjavik. And here we were uh, doing the show called uh, Velvet Terrorism, Pussy Riots Russia, where, which is an overview of Pussy Riots actions in Russia from 2012 to 2022. And... Uh, and uh, no, no, yeah, from 2011, like the first pieces from 2011. And um, of course, like most known is their, is their piece, uh, Punk Prayer, uh, where they, uh, which is, I think, in my opinion, like the kind of greatest performance artwork of the 21st century. And, uh, and where they uh, did this action inside this mega church in Moscow, and uh, and and the kind of then that was when the whole world saw that uh, Russia was heading for something very very dark, and uh, they were arrested and sent to prison in the in kind of gulag like prisons, and uh, for two years, uh, Masha Lokhina and Nadia uh, Tolokonikova, and uh, and the exhibition we did was to was the idea to try and. Uh, Kind of first started with like just from Masha's telephone to just like make a, just like printed out photos of all the actions of Pussy Riot inside Russia, and you know and you know then like you know the crazy task of like you know contacting everyone who was documenting these performances and writing a description of them to do to do to to manage to do like an overview of this uh, this mass of performance work. And uh, to to just do a tryout, a kind of try and show it in an artist-run space here in Reykjavik called Klingenbang, and uh, and uh, it was premiered there uh, in uh, in 2022 uh, in uh, in at the end of November, and uh, and uh, you know kind of and the show went very well. I mean, like the. Uh, the Washington Post called it well, like one one of the shows of the year back then, and then now this year because uh, uh, we were working with Luciana, then like uh, Tina Kostrup, the curator at uh, Luciana, suggested that we we that the show would also go to Luciana. So it it is now on view there and also at the Mac in Montreal, and it's gonna travel more and. Um, and here you see it's like it's like it's all these street actions kind of you're trying to uh, to present them in the art space and and it, it's it's uh, I mean I mean we all know like yeah this I put this here like you know like it's quite it's quite impressive for a performance art group to have done like yeah three works that were like you know kind of internationally known but they had there had never been a been an overview show of theirs. They like this, like the punk prayer, and then this is called the uh, policeman enters the game uh, from 2018 when they run into the field at the World Cup at the the final game, kind of uh, reminding reminding the world of how life was in Russia that you like always under constant police surveillance, and you know you are enjoying life, but the police is always there to bug you. And kind of the same was for, with the whole world. They were uh, enjoying the game between France and Croatia, and suddenly the police ran into to the field, and that was Pussy Riot members dressed as uh, policemen and women. But uh, they were of course caught, and uh, and uh, 
and one of them, Peter here, he was uh, actually uh, poisoned by military poison, and uh, you know, like like Navalny, and but he luckily survived and has been kind of. Uh, He's now in Ukraine fighting with the Ukrainian army. And um, and here's another kind of unknown Pussy Riot action, which uh, which is one of the actions like I totally love. It's uh, it's an action where Pussy Riot uh, went with uh, just with paper planes to attack the FSB building. The FSB building is kind of the most feared building in Moscow. It's like the headquarters of the secret police, FSB, it used to be KGB. And uh, you know, tens of thousands of people have died in the cellars of this building, and uh, and uh, and they just attacked it with paper planes. And uh, and uh, here you see sort of how the exhibition was uh, was uh, what's it called? Like yeah, we found the form. The form was just like a lot of information, a lot of pictures, everything like just like drawn onto the walls and uh, and titles just uh, executed with tape and uh, all very kind of punk rock and roll aesthetics etc so yeah so here is a this is a little overview of kind of what I've been working on this year and you know and and in the past years one could say thank you so much this is fantastic. Ragnar, and, uh, you know, and of course, um, it, <laughs> I don't think any of us need to be reminded why you felt that the uh, the, the George Michael song was appropriate for these dark times, because this truly is a dark time. Thank you for this, uh, you know, and, and, and it always it always um, impresses me how you mix uh, this kind of romanticism and longing and, and aspects of love and forgiveness with um, with a real recognition of the of the reality of the world in, in which, you know, um, <laughs> we're all trying to find our way and um, stumbling um, as we do. And, and seeing institutions like American democracy crumbling under the pressure of yeah. trying to find its way, which uh, which is something that must be rather shocking for someone from abroad to see. Maybe it's not. Maybe American democracy has always seemed like a like another TV show. Like, um, no, like, no. You know, it it is shocking to see it to see all the breakdowns kind of it's it is shocking because because i mean it sounds almost like uh silly to say it but like you know <laughs> but like you know uh you know i'm kind of raised in the cold war when like you know this idea of you know there was like i mean i'm raised by kind of kind of uh, very lefty parents you know i went to like uh you know kind of anti american rallies etc but but there was always this idea of American democracy working and uh, and American institutions working and like us this kind of you know this 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 elegance of America which is kind of very much crumbling now be before our eyes and uh, yeah. sorry I can only hope that we, that we've hit bottom and it's sort of like I said I <laughs> oh, I'm having some yeah internet instability here I can only hope that like. Um, like somebody with an alcohol problem that we've hit bottom as a nation and that we are, you know, that we're going to now move back towards the light. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, as we approach the darkest days of 2023, yeah, um, you know, in the next week, it's as dark as it's going to get. Um, I'm hoping that the, that the, the way up will, will give us some, some hope, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, hopefully, because I mean, America is still a democracy and, and also, like what 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 I was like so inspired by, you know, by working with Pussy Riot is like this kind of, I mean, they they are they were always just like you know saying you know Russia is just um, you know it's an example you know it's you know these are not specially Russian problems you know totalitarianism and and kind of patriarchal uh, you know brutal call for submission and uh, but and now mm. and we're seeing that on the rise everywhere. And, uh, yeah. and 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 you know, if you know it's it's a it's a more pernicious virus than COVID nineteen. Hmm? Absolutely, and it's, and and it's spreading. Know, it's, it's, and it's spreading. It's, too, right? it's hmm. spreading. We're kind of thinking now. We're kind of thinking about the good old COVID days. You know, when it was just like <laughs> a virus, but not like human beings uh, being dangerous. 
Well, you know, it was horrible also. And it was a horrible combination of, you know, in our country of Trump and the virus. So we, you know, uh, it, 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 these, these were dark times. And and the humor that you managed to to extract from these situations is 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 quite wonderful. Before we end the, the webinar uh, part of our program today, I just wanted to uh, read you two questions by the same person that came in while you were talking, a woman named yeah. Gabriella Selva. I don't know if you can read them yourself. One of them was, nope, uh, I, I right now I was lucky enough to see your exhibition at Louisiana and was mesmerized by the visitor's experience. She's, she's wondering uh, whether or not um, for the installation you uh, you you went and re refilmed things many times where you just took that took it from uh, uh, you know or just uh, made just an addition of it and took it from the top. Yeah, I mean the, the like a piece like the visitors is you know it was shot you know, in 2012, and it's like re reinstalled in uh, in various museums when it's being shown. It's sort of, it's basically like a video piece traveling, but it's always... Yeah, so, so it's just the different channels that are each on their own projector, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the same with with a, a lot of, you know, a lot of these pieces. Right, so, and, so, and of course, you've always, you had, those are the channels that you edited or mixed to make the same, the soundtracks. You had a 12 channel mix, essentially. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the soundtrack was just like, and the, the film and sound is just like done at the same time, of course. So it's like, so it's basically uh, just a documentation of a thing in time. Yeah. Right. And then the other, her other question was a comment, just I love the Pussy Riot gifts to Putin putting up the rainbow flags in the buildings. So I mean, that is one of the, I was just looking for, but we didn't have an installation photos of that piece. That's one of my favorite pieces by them, because it was for Putin's birthday in 2020, like the birthday of Vladimir fucking Putin. They went disguised as city workers, kind of the whole gang. They like gathered, you know, like stations of the gang and they went like early in the morning and they put the rainbow flag on all uh, main institutions of uh, of like, yeah, of the Russian state. And it was like, you know, it's like the FSB building, and the offices of the president of Russia and the culture ministry, the Russian high court, and also like Moscow's main police station. And uh, and and I just love Amazing. it. Like there's a video of, of them where like, you know, they're putting a flag on the ministry of culture. And, you know, there comes a guard going like, what are you doing? And they're just like in their city overall, like, uh, we don't know. We're just, you know, under orders to do some decorations because of the president's birthday. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's amazing. And, you know, it of course makes makes me think that the, the little protest that you and I did in front of your parliament building yeah, yeah, was yeah. you know so meager and, so, and, and so you know and so and so innocent and so you know there was no danger to it. The no. only danger was that we would that our hands would freeze. But um, other than that, you know, the real the real political activism. I mean, I guess you you kind of parody that in some of in some of the work as well. Is that the you know the the, act, the real activism is something else other than kind of metaphorical activism, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but like, but in a way, like you know, after you know working with the uh, Busirero and getting to know them, like, like you know, you really realize like the luxury of working in a in a country where there is free speech, and uh, right. that you can actually we can all make the art we want to, but you know maybe somebody's gonna go nuts on Twitter or something, but it's you know. We're not going to get beaten and put into prison for for doing the wrong kind of art. Uh, so it's always well, like when people are like, "Oh, you can't do anything nowadays." I'm like, "No, no, you actually can." I, just somebody's just going to go <laughs> nuts on Twitter. That's all. <laughs> it, it was it was great to see the Louisiana exhibition, and 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 I think it's a wonderful place for you for you to have had a survey exhibition, given the colonial relationship between uh, Denmark and Iceland, and. Uh, you know, and so, and the fact that you dealt with that is there as well. You know, that it's kind of an openly decolonized situation. I think. You know, I think in a way, and well, I, maybe, and I, maybe maybe Iceland isn't fully decolonized yet. I don't. I don't know. No, but it's also interesting because it's like you know, I don't. You know, it's like it's a it's it's an interesting uh, setup with Iceland and Denmark and kind of the idea of colonization because. Because like there's so much in the culture here that is Danish and uh, and uh, 
And as I as I spoke, like you know, so much about the national identities being you know kind of victims of the Danes, right. but but history is more complicated than that. And yeah. uh, and Iceland's and history is, is particularly complicated, given yeah yeah, and basically Dennis because they were, yeah, so we were like a colony of Denmark for, for right. six years, but before that we were actually ruled by the Norwegian king because we asked the king to rule us because there was civil war happening here, so. You know, so but but of course, like you know, the, the Danes just like you know took a lot from Iceland, etc. And it was very, you know, it was very all very humiliating and hard. But but in a way, I think, uh, yeah, I just find I just found it found it uh, interesting to 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 show it there because it's an old old piece. It's from two thousand and three to show it in there and and like also oh, the times now because now. Like you know, when the piece was made in two thousand three, you know it was just funny. But now you're like really, now like the times, you know, tell the viewer that you really have to take this piece seriously. And you know, like I didn't actually take it seriously when I was filming it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because most, <laughs> and we'll have to end this in a second. But most people didn't really take the decolonizing sensibility seriously, even though you know intellectuals like Gatry Spivak was writing about it in the nineteen eighties and even earlier. There were, People really didn't take it um, seriously until fairly recently, and yeah. now it's making everyone think the nature of uh, of the way European and world history progressed, uh, <laughs> you know, in the 18th, 19th, and even 20th century. Anyhow, thank you for sharing this on the webinar. I will see you on the other side on the private website. You have the address for that. See you there in yes. a couple of seconds. Okay, and to those thank of you, you so who much. Again today, thank you so much uh, for we'll uh... again next. Yeah. yeah. We'll do this again next uh, next fall as part of uh, uh, the uh, the curatorial practice graduate program at the School of Visual Arts. Until then, uh, thanks again for tuning in, and again, thank you so much, Ragnar. Really great. Thank you. See you in a few minutes. See you. See you. Bye bye.